Take your Bible, turn to Galatians, if you would, and we're going to be, um, somebody suggested this, and so um, I, I think this is a good idea for us to go through. Um, somebody was mentioning to me about the love of God, and from, from their point of view of it, I like, I like how they put it. Um, everybody, and this is what I found out becoming an adult. When I was little here, I had this very high image of the adults in this church uh, because I thought their lives were perfect. I thought that these great men and women here could do no wrong. When I was a young teenager in this church, uh, we went through a pretty violent church split. And when I say violent, I mean, I've said this before, but a woman in this church during a business meeting got up, slapped a deacon in the face during the business meeting. And her husband sat there and let her do it. And um, so, you know, as a young person watching this, it hurt me. It bothered me. And so, you know, then you start realizing that these, some of these people are not as good as what you thought they were. And so, when I become an adult, it's then that I realize that those adults were not perfect. They were far from it. All of them. And uh, even the ones that I would still to this day consider godly people, godly men and women. Um, you know, you find out things about them, that they had their own share of problems, they had their own share of struggles, they went through times in life that were not easy to get through. They had sins that, you know, they just didn't talk about openly. And so... I've learned in my life about God's sustaining, unquenchable love for me. And there are many times when I ask the question, God, why do you put up with me? God, why did you love me? God, why did you, uh, why did you love me enough to correct me? Why did you love me enough to care about me? And um, sometimes I just don't understand the answer. I, don't, I know it's the love of God. Um, I love my wife. I love my family. I love this church. I love this country. I love the people of Kenya that we try to labor and, and serve there. Um, and try to do everything I can for them. But I have not... I have, would not be willing to sacrifice one of my children for any of them. And I love people. And I love my family. And to ask me to sacrifice one of my own children for somebody, for somebody who has repeatedly shown me that they're my enemy, to ask me to do that, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. But that's the very love of God. Is that we know that Christ, and this is why I don't like Calvinism. Calvinism says that Christ only died for the predestinated elect. That he, Christ did not die for everybody else in the world. He only died for the elect. And that is unbiblical. Calvin, I don't know what he was thinking on that day, but he was wrong. He was dead wrong. Christ did not die just for the predestinated elect. He died for everybody. He died for his worst, fiercest enemies. He died for them. Even though most people will reject God's love and reject Christ and hate God and hate Christ. Because they don't understand. They'll reject. But he, God loved them anyway. Enough to give them 
his only begotten son to suffer for them and in their place. That kind of love, you can say whatever you want to about how you love people, but you've never sacrificed your own child for your, for your worst enemies, okay? Only God has that ability. That's what sets him apart from the rest of us. This is why I'm not currently running for God next year. Because I, I, I don't love people that much, but God does. But then, uh, I want you to notice on the screen, Galatians 5, turn there very quickly. Um, I got an idea the other day, and I want to try to write something. I haven't written a book in a while, but I want to get back into writing. And there's several things I want to write about, but I, 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 I got an idea Friday for a book I think would be easy to write, and it's on the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, just dealing with the nine fruits of the Spirit and what they mean to us as Christians and so on. And I want you to notice Galatians 5.22, the very first gift, the very first fruit that is manifested to us who are believers in God's Son, Jesus Christ, the very first one, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the very first thing. There's joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Um, I ought to have these memorized, but I don't. Uh, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. I would like to have sustaining joy, peace, long, and we can. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance, and I, I like the King James. The new translations call that, they translate that word as self-control. And I don't like the word self-control because I don't control myself very well. What I like is temperance. And what that means is tempered steel, tempered glass, it's gone through the fire and been hardened. Okay? And that's what that means. It means that you have the ability to endure and last and go through things better than you used to. The molecular structure of your life has been changed to such an extent that you can endure things that you never thought you could endure. But getting back to that fruit of the Spirit, the very first thing that he mentions, and I, and I want you to notice this. Look in your Bible, verses 22 and 23. Notice that he does not say the fruit of the Spirit being obedience. He does not mention obedience here. Look at there, it's snowing. There's a little snowflake, big, big wet snowflakes coming down with that rain. Is that what I, am I seeing it right? Okay. Yeah, could be. So anyway, God, you will obey him. It's that simple. If you love God, and I, I listened to it when one of those Sundays we were out because we were snowed out. Y'all didn't get snowed out down in Mobile, did you? Okay. They just don't get it. Have they ever gotten snow down there? Twice last year. Yeah, dust. Okay. But on that one Sunday, I decided to go to church with Reg Kelly. He is my pastor. And um, I picked probably, I think God picked the message for me because God really dealt with me on that. And it was about loving God. And he said, you mark it down. Every sin you have ever committed was because you did not love God enough to do what he said. And he's right about that. If you love God enough, there are just things that you won't do. And you do it not out of commandment, not out of strict obedience. You do it out of love for God. You just won't do that against God. And so when you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are designed, you know, um, no other gods before me, no graven image, do not take the Lord's name in vain, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And then it transitions, honor thy father and thy mother, that's a transitional commandment. Then the rest of them deal with thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Those are commandments that are, they are sins against our neighbor. And uh, in in Jesus said, on these two hang all the law 
and the prophets. All the law is hung on these two. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you'll love your neighbor, you'll not slander your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you will not tip his trash cans over in the middle of the night because his dog got out and did yours. If you love your neighbor, you'll not covet after your neighbor's wife. If you love your neighbor, you'll not, you'll not do these things. You won't kill your neighbor if you love your neighbor. You won't do these things that we want to do against people. And so the number one, the primary thing that is important with God is love. In fact, the scriptures say God is love. God is love. To, if you want to understand God, then understand love, not the way man gives it, but the way God gives it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And what I, was, what I was saying earlier about, you know, realizing that we adults, we have our shared problems, is that instead of condemning everybody that we know, everybody that we meet, instead of condemning everybody because of things they did, when you recognize and realize that they are no different than yourself in their ability to mess up life, when you realize that, then you'll have compassion on them, whereas before you did not have compassion on them. You'll love them, whereas before you did not love them. They get themselves in trouble and you say, fine, you did that to yourself, you deserve what you get. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But you could love that person. Yeah, sometimes there's hard, tough love. But you have compassion for that person and want for them to have a better way of life, a better living. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So think about this. This passage is telling us that before God ever created the universe, He loved you knowing what sins you would commit, what disobedience you would get into, knowing that the things that you did in life were going to be wrong and against His commandments. God put His love on you in spite of that. Let me give you an example out of the scriptures. In the book of Hosea. Hosea is commanded by God to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. Gomer's occupation just happens to be what they refer to as the world's oldest profession. Gomer is a harlot, a prostitute. Gomer's idea of love is, I will love you if you pay me. And that turns out to be, believe it or not, the most accepted or the most prevalent form of love that is in this world. In other words, I will return favors to you as long as you give me what I demand or what I ask for. And believe it or not, I think there are exceptions, but I think most couples love each other that way only. In other words, I will love you as long as you treat me right. I will love you as long as you are nice to me. I will love you as long as you give me love. I will love you as long as you give me what I want, what I demand. I will love you I, and I will return that as long as you do this for me. I had in my office, believe it or not, a 17 year old boy. His dad brought him. They came to church here for a little while. His dad brought him to me along with this 17 year old boy's 20 year old girlfriend. And they were sleeping together in mom and dad's house. So dad and mom brought them to me wanting me to marry them. 
What they were wanting was they were wanting me to make their love affair legal because what she was doing was committing a felony because he was a minor. This had been going on apparently since he was 16. So I'm, I'm hearing this and in my mind, I'm shaking my head. I'm going, are you people crazy? So I asked dad to step out and I talked to him a little bit and I asked the young man, I said, do you love her? He said, oh yeah, I love her. And uh, I said, why are you doing with each other what you're doing? And he said, it's because I love her. And I said, no, you don't. You're not doing this to her because you love her. You're doing this to her because you love yourself. I said, if you loved her and kick her out of the house and you two separate until you're of legal age and then you can marry her and then separate without doing this ever again until marriage, if you love her. They didn't want that. They wanted to continue in their illicit, illegal affair and me make it legal for them. And I brought the dad in and I said, you know, I just, I don't like making people upset and angry with me, but I absolutely refuse to do this because there is nothing about this situation that is right. Not anything. But they, you know, tried to convince me that they loved each other, but they didn't. They loved themselves and they were, they were willing to love each other as long as each other were putting out. But you take that away and it didn't exist. And I, I do. I think a lot of people are together now. Um, and I, I'm going to say this too. Sodomites, I do not believe, are capable of loving each other the way a normal man and wife loves each other. I do not believe that that's what's going on. I do not believe that at all. Their idea of love is already so perverted that it is a billion miles away from God's idea of it. It is. It absolutely is. And it's the love that says, I love you and let's get, here's two guys, I love you and let's get married because I want in this long-term relationship with you. And I guarantee you, that's not going to happen. Even if you get, even if they get married, that's not going to happen. Okay. I know that's rough and mean and cruel and everything else, but I just, I just have this idea. It's a very cynical view of what this world has turned love into. So let me, let me finish the story about Gomer. Gomer. Here's Hosea being commanded by God to love Gomer. Now, Gomer is a type of Israel. And, but Hosea, you know, he's going to do what God said, but he ends up loving Gomer. And I mean loving her. And he's got it in his mind that if he marries her, then he's going to, he's going to really make an honest woman out of her. So they get married and now there's a couple of kids, but I don't think it could be said that those kids are Hosea's kids because he finds her out back doing what she was doing before they got married. And then Gomer is gone. Run out on him. Now, scripturally, scripturally, there's grounds for divorce right there. And the illustration that was being made here is uh, God actually wrote a bill of divorce to Israel and said, I'm tired of your harlotries. I'm tired of your adulteries. I'm tired of putting up with it. And God divorced the nation of Israel. But Gomer love or excuse me Hosea loves Gomer so much that he sends the kids out go find your mom I want to know where she is 
So they come back. Dad, um, she's in the slave market being sold. So Hosea then takes the money and he goes and finds Gomer and he pays the price so he can buy her back. Even though legally she's his wife, he doesn't, he doesn't have to pay anybody for anything, but he pays the price anyway. This time around, Gomer's different. Okay, and it's a picture of Israel. Now, that's the kind of love I'm talking about. To love somebody like Hosea loved Gomer, even though all Gomer has done is mistreat him. There used to be a woman in this church. I'd known her for years. She had a husband that I only met maybe once or twice in my life. And that husband of hers, he had money. So he kept his wife, which was the woman who went to this church. And then he had his mistress. And Phil, 80% of the time, he was with his mistress. And people would ask this lady, why do you put up with that? And she said, I love him. And she knew where he was. It was no secret. Every now and then he'd come home and stay with his wife. And people would ask, why, why, are, you, why are you still with this guy? She said, I love him. And at his funeral, both women showed up. Now that, there's no doubt I know where this man is spending his eternity. But she loved that man until the day he died. Okay? And I'm not saying that everybody has to be that way. But I'm saying, if you love them, you can be that way. If you love somebody, you'll long suffer with them. If you love somebody, you'll put up with them. And you'll forbear with them. And never give up. God did not give up on you. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. I'm going to give you this and, and we'll start here next Sunday. I read this one time and I had to run away and cry somewhere. I was with, I was down at Bible camp years ago and a friend of mine, a, a fellow pastor down there, and he and I, we, had, we had always had some great times at camp. We used to cut up and I mean, he was a riot. I just, I enjoyed getting to be with him for a week out of every year. And he had just taken over a church in Kansas City. A church that eventually he ended up losing that church because he had an affair with another woman. And um, his wife took him back. And he was selling cars for a living. And uh, he had had an ongoing heart condition. He was only late 40s, early 50s. He was probably my age, the, the way I am now. And um, he ended up wrecking his car in some people's front yard, turned it over. But they say he was dead before the car accident happened. That's what caused the car accident. His heart blew, it literally blew up on him and it killed him. And I went to the man's funeral. Because I loved him. And I, I believe he's in heaven. Okay? I mean, he did the right thing. He got out and kept his marriage going. And I believe God forgave him. Okay? But he came to me one time and he said, um, he had the book, Purpose Driven Church. And he said, have you read this? And I said, N I said, no, that's not really for me. And he said, well, we got to do something. We got to get people in our churches. And he kept trying to sell that idea to me. And I'd already been through that. And 
So we talked a little bit and then he left. And I, I'm just going, God, should I be doing whatever it takes? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing, should I be following Rick Warren, you know, to get people in and so on? And God directed me to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, I think, is part of what expresses why God what does what he does. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Now, we know Israel. Israel's actions did not reflect how God saw them. Their deeds were evil. This is after. God says this after. They've done the, they've made the golden calf thing. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with the mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Why did God pick the worst people in the world? Because the Jews are terrible people. You talk about high and mighty and racist, the Jews are because of Moses and Abraham to this day, they still think they are God's people. In fact, when you study a little bit about the Kabbalah, some of these Jewish rabbis are so up on this that they think the only people in the world who can get close to God are the Jews and anybody else who tries Kabbalah is wasting their time because God, God hates them. They still think this way to this day. And why does God long suffer with them? Why is God going to redeem them? Why is God going to take 144,000 of them and put his seal in their forehead and preserve them in the end of time? Why is God going to, why is God going to keep his promise to them? Because he loves them. Even though they've gone out multiple times and harlowed themselves against God and done everything God said not to do. When it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself, you don't think the Jews are that way because they're not. And when it comes to honoring God, they don't. Because they're even, they read the Old Testament, but their ideas of it are a million miles away from what it really means. So if God can favor them, why does he do it? Because he loves them. He loves them. And he's willing to do, I mean, who did Christ, we're the recipients of salvation, but who did Christ come to first? He came to his own, and his own received him not. He came to the Jews. God still loves them. God loves the Jews enough to make his son come into this world as a Jew. Could have picked anybody, but he made him come down as a Jew. Okay? So, study relevant portions of the scripture pertaining to God's un conditional love what that means is i'll love you whether you love me or not i'm going to love you and i'm not going to stop that's what that means when you can love your enemies i mean love your enemies when you can love people who don't love you back that's a gift and the fruit of god's spirit but this other type of love it's like, yeah, I'll love you as long as you act right. But if you don't act right, I don't love you anymore. That's not love. It's not God's version of it. Heavenly Father, teach us. And God, I, I cannot condemn anybody for not loving people because God, there are people that I just really do not like. And I am really struggling when it comes to my enemies. So Father, teach me to love people that I don't love and give it to me as a gift. That way, I'll know it was from you and I won't take the credit for it because love 
charity is not puffed up. Father, we thank you for your unconditional love for us. We wouldn't be here today without it. We thank you for it. Teach us how to do it. Give us the ability to love people that we're angry at. Love people, Lord, that have hurt us. Love people that have slandered us. Love people that in a moment they would kill us. Help us to love sinners. Help us to love sinners. Thank you, God, for teaching us. Make us to understand, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.